Now, let's go to today's interview. Our guest is Charles Durrett, architect. With partner Catherine McCommons, Durrett is credited with coining the English term co-housing and introducing co-housing model to North America. Co-housing is a type of intentional community composed of small private homes with full kitchens supplemented by extensive common facilities. A co-housing community is planned, owned and managed by the residents, groups of people who want more interaction with their neighbors. In recent years, Chuck has focused on co-housing for older persons. He is the author of The Senior Co-Housing Handbook, A Community Approach to Independent Living, and with Catherine McCammond is co-author of Co-Housing, A Contemporary Approach to Housing Ourselves, and Creating Co-Housing, Building Sustainable Communities. Chuck is the recipient or co-recipient of numerous awards from the American Institute of Architects, as well as the United Nations World Habitat Award in 2001 for the East Lake Commons Conservation Community Project in Atlanta, Georgia, and the Vision 2020 Award of the Sierra Business Council. Welcome to Mind, Body, Health, and Politics, Chuck. Thank you so much, Richard. Appreciate it, man. So let's begin. I'd said a little bit about what co-housing is. I'd like you to talk more about co-housing, and then we'll talk about a solution to homelessness. Great. Well, uh, co-housing, now there's 200 of them around the country, and uh, fundamentally they have six common characteristics. One is that they're very much uh, designed, organized, developed, co-developed with the future residents. So in a a way, it's a a custom neighborhood with uh, an intention of serving the culture, um, whatever subculture we're talking about, whether it's in Stillwater, Oklahoma, or Minneapolis, Minnesota, or San Francisco. But um, we try to dive deep and figure out who this culture, not only who they are now, but who they want to be. And that's where the, the real uh, blessing is because, uh, you know, it, it turns out that most people want to be in a setting where they know their neighbors, they care about their neighbors, and they support their neighbors. And that doesn't happen by accident. That has to be designed into the picture. And, you know, the best of humanity comes together when you're sitting there working with 40 or 50 uh, people. So that's one. Two, as you mentioned, there's extensive common facilities. For example, where I live, there's a 4,000 square foot common house and we have a, a great workshop and we have, uh, you know, dinners uh, six nights a week available. If you're interested, most people eat in the common house two or three times a week pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. We're, we're about ready to reopen the common house. And the key there is, is that, you know, in the good times, which we've had for 15 years now, um, you know, we get to uh, we get to commune with our neighbors at a, at a level that is is uh, is not really seen except for uh you know high functioning villages and high functioning neighborhoods no doubt but um you know i make dinner for my neighbors once a month for example and, a lot, and lots of other things and we share you know well over a hundred things for example we only have one lawnmower for for uh, 34 households and that's fine we have one hot tub we have one swimming pool all of that works fine we have uh, great gardens superb gardens and um and so that when the bad times hit, like a pandemic or otherwise, you know, we, uh, we are, can support each other. So we very much believe in social distancing for sure, but not social isolation. In fact, this weekend, I just had a, a, a long conversation with three of my neighbors, each of them sitting on their own front porches about 20 feet away from my front porch. So that worked just fine. Um, the third thing is that it's, um, uh, it's designed to facilitate a sense of community over time. That includes many aspects. For example, the parking is held to, you know, one place and everybody walks through their house from 20 feet to 500 feet distance. Um, It was interesting when a a 90-year-old in our community uh, moved from right next to the parking 
to the farthest house from the parking, 500 feet away. And I asked her, Meg, why did you do that? And she said, because my relationship with my neighbor far exceeds my relationship with my car. So uh, the fourth thing is it's entirely self-managed. The fifth thing is that it's, um, um, uh, there's, no common, uh, there's no common budget other than what we share for the common facilities. And the sixth thing is that um, there's no hierarchy. Everything is made, all decisions are made by consensus. Let's go back to the beginning, uh, please. Uh, can you hear me? Let's go back to the very beginning. Did I hear you say that you organize the people who are going to live in the community before the community is built? Before, sometimes before the property is even purchased, yes. How do you go about doing that? Well, usually, for example, where I live, uh, it's a little town of 3,000 people. It wasn't obvious that uh, co-housing would catch, get traction here. But I, I came to town and made sure all the bookstores had a copy of the book. At the time, there were six or seven bookstores in this little town. It's well known for its bookstores per capita. Every, uh, every bookstore had a copy. The libraries had a copy. Um, I talked to the radio station. I talked to the newspaper. And, uh, you know, we... Uh, sat down and waited and uh, you know we we sat down with eight people who were on our database for this town and um they put up flyers everywhere and etc and we had 150 people come into the room and we knew we had a project at that point i mean our litmus test is basically if if 50 people show up or more then we probably have a project if we if 50, 49 or less show up we may or may not have a project but um uh you know people can choose at that point whether to pursue it further or not. So anyway, we do this public presentation. And then the next day, in this case, we had a site, uh, a site tour of a site that Katie and I had already um, put a down payment on. And then um, uh, uh, four weeks later, we had what's called a getting it built workshop, which is two full days of talking about what it takes to put a project together, you know, how to uh, invest and what if you don't have any money to invest and how we get all of that accomplished. Um, group process is probably the number one thing that we talk about. You can have all the land you want and all the, all the money you want, but if you don't know how to function as a group, you're um, debilitated. Turns out, actually, a lot of the people in this town had actually read the book before we even showed up. So it really pays to, um, you know, get, make it, it, it's much more than a sound bite. You know, uh, co-housing is people have to drill down and figure out all the little nuances that they're concerned about. You know, what if some difficult person moves into the neighborhood and, you know, it's just a, it, people bring a lot of fear to the table for sure. So we have to address those questions before we can actually make progress for sure. And, um, and then uh, we did a public presentation, then we did a getting it built workshop, how you get your money in, how you get it out, and um, what the entitlement process will look like, what the um, design process will look like. We, we make it all extremely deliberate. Every, every weekend we'll have a topic. You know, um, we have 12 full days of, of workshops to get a, a project built. And um, on this day, we're going to do this. And on this day, we're going to do that, you know, because... Our culture is kind of funny. We very much focus on the thing. So invariably, people will come to the table and they'll say, oh, my God, it's got to be straw bale or it's got to be, you know, uh, panel construction or something like that. And I, I always argue, you know, we're going to get to that question, but we got to get to these more social questions first. Um, then we have a site design workshop, you know, where we spend two full days talking about the goals and the activities that they want to see happen on the site. You know, I want to I want to have a choice between privacy and community at all times. Um, the activities, I want to be able to um, readily gather with my neighbors and I want to readily be private when I feel like it. And the places, you know, what does a, what does a gathering node feel like? What does a backyard feel like? What does a front yard feel like? Um, and all of the, the different components. And the, we usually have about 30 to 50 goals and 100 to 150 activities on the site and uh, probably four or 500 details that go into the design itself. Um, you know, once people start to see the big picture, um, they get very, very comfortable with how it's going to say it, but Ayn Rand was probably right. We do 
pretty much everything for ourselves. But when they see that cooperation serves me as a person, um, you know, they, uh, they move forward in that direction. You know, people often ask me, Chuck, what's the common denominator for people who move into co-housing? And um, I really believe that it's, um, it's these individuals believe that their own individual life will be easier, more convenient, more practical, more economical, uh, more interesting, more fun, more healthy, if they give cooperation the benefit of the doubt than if they don't. If they try to do everything in their own house, um, they'll find life more difficult. If I do things with my neighbors, they'll find life more Let me take you back. I'm still a, a very much uh, interested in the organizational process. So you put up the notices, uh, people show up, uh, perhaps more people than you have housing for. Is there then a selection process? How do you organize the selection? Tell us something about that. Yeah, uh, no, I mean, basically, of course, some of those 150 people just came to see what co-housing was interesting about it. But the first workshop called the Getting It Built Workshop is... Um, it cost a couple hundred dollars per household. So people realize right off the bat that whether this is for them or not, I mean, they have to see the long-term savings and there really is. I've interviewed about 200 people, you know, how much money do you save living in co-housing and the numbers have ranged from 200 a month to 2,400 a month. So, um, so you have to see the long-term investment that you're making, but uh, yeah, the workshops cost money. So only 25 households, showed up to the Getting a Built workshop, and we were building 34. So uh, we rarely run into the place time where we have, where, cause it, because they're ready now, they're interested now, they're ready to start committing weekends to getting this thing built. You know, it's a, it's a bit of an investment. When you say there's a savings of between 200 and 2,400 a month, a savings as compared to what, Chuck? Their life before they moved into co-housing. I see. And are these, uh, can you tell us something about the demographics of the people? Do you like, do you set, when you send out the announcement, you say, are we looking for people between a particular age group? Like, how, how does that work? Or is it all ages? Is it intergenerational? Yeah, for the most part, everybody's welcome, no doubt about it. I mean, we absolutely try to make a project happen for whoever comes to the table, whatever their unique situation is, situations are in that unique demographic. Um, that said, you know, Paul Ray in his book called Cultural Creatives, you know, very much uh, delineates the co-houser, which is, I don't feel like I have to do what my parents did just because my parents did it. In other words, and it's interesting when we do intergenerational co-housing, you know, the parents often say, you know, to their young kid, what are you doing? You could own your own house and you should get your own house with a front lawn and a back lawn and two car garage and a driveway and all the rest. And interestingly enough, when we uh, design projects for seniors, oftentimes the kids are saying, you know, what are you doing, mom and dad? You know, you you should be getting, uh, you know, ready for, uh, you know, assisted care or something like that. And people and seniors move into uh, co-housing because they don't want to live in those institutions. In fact, more people tell me that they want to live in senior co-housing because they don't want to grow old like their parents did than anything else. So that, that's the plurality of reasons that they're, they're uh, migrating towards senior co-housing. So the demographic is quite varied. I mean, very varied. Um, there's, uh, uh, you know, when we did the first, pro uh, the second project in the San Francisco Bay Area, it was quite interesting to me that uh, only one person in that group, which was me, was born in the USA. Um, everybody else was born in a foreign country and they had a very astute sense of the value of community. I mean, in some ways they weren't cultural creatives, that particular group, because they had, whether they grew up in the Philippines or South Africa or Mexico um, or the Netherlands, um, they, had a, they, had lived, they had come from a village. So they knew the advantage of village life. And uh, for the rest of us, we have to reimagine a life where living with our neighbors makes sense. And so it's a more of a conscious act. In fact, the Danes would say, in fact, that they weren't doing anything new when, the, when, when, the, when co-housing got started in Denmark in 1972. They weren't doing anything new, but they were um, consciously creating the kind of lifestyle that used to come natural 
where people knew and cared and supported each other. There's a couple of things I'd like you to elaborate on, please. First of all, you said that there's been some comments that families make. Why don't you get your own house instead? But these people are living in their own house, aren't they? Yes, that's a good point. I should mention that. Yeah, everybody has a house. I mean, uh, I have a you know, fine two-story townhouse condominium. It's like they're condominiums typically. Um, they have their own house, um, kitchens, bathrooms, all the rest. But it's funny how many reporters have visited me and, while they're sitting in my kitchen and asked, do you guys have your own kitchen? And, the, and we do. But anyway, the, um, uh, but we drilled down and looked closely at where in our, you know, repertoire of accoutrement that make our life, you know, comfortable, is it done better with our neighbors than done by ourselves? For example, 26 of the 34 households where I live do their laundry in the common house. Um, they could all afford their own laundry if they wanted to, but it's actually, you know, much more economical to do it there. We buy our very state-of-the-art biodegradable detergent at a third off, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and um, we have state-of-the-art washers and dryers, and it's the only place in the community that we can actually recycle the gray water towards the, um, uh, towards the landscaping. It's the only place to do it economically, to do it in the private houses. So, that reaches so many goals and it's quieter to do it in the common house than in your own house. It creates less moisture and therefore less mold in your own house. In the common house, you absolutely can ventilate it adequately. In other words, you know, when you really look at it, the many nuances about why we do our laundry in the common house, for example, it only makes sense. And it's when it only makes sense to everybody that we choose to do it there. And when people see that it has nothing to do with a regular laundromat, et cetera, et cetera. There's no similarity whatsoever. It just happens to be all state-of-the-art working machines. And one person in the community uh, calls a repair person when they break down, as opposed to 34 different households happen to call the repair person when they break down. And so he gets a repertoire with that person and everything happens rapidly and you know, state-of-the-art, et cetera, et cetera. And that's just so one of a hundred examples. Well, I'd like to hear some more of the other examples, because as a listener, I'm saying to myself as you're talking, how does this differ from a developer who buys a piece of property, builds 50 homes, and sells them to 50 different people? Well, one way you're telling us is different is that in your situation with co-housing, the people are organized prior to the building and they're involved in the building. And now you're telling us another way it's different is that there is some kind of a special uh, shared a laundry facility. What are some of the other ways that this co-housing differs from a development of 50 houses uh, where everybody buys individually? I can get to some of the line items, but it is when you, especially when you include the construction, it's literally thousands of different ways. For example, you know, uh, among these, you know, group of people who become very conscious of the issues as they're, you know, growing themselves and uh, and co-developing these projects, you know, they've many of them had lived in in uh, in um, attached housing before. None of them liked it because they could hear their neighbors. So I often argue that the environmentalist of the future is going to be the acoustic engineer, who in my case helps me make sure that my neighbors never hear each other. My neighbors never hear me. I never hear them. The, um, the, the, the acoustic engineer that helps Americans figure out how to live closer to each other comfortably is going to be the environmentalist of the future. When we got the ha Human Habitat Award, the, um, the UN told us that, you know, as far as we got it that year because they had decided that the American middle class is the locus on the planet. And that's partially because they live so far away from each other. Therefore, they have to draw, drive towards each other. And therefore, they have to consume so many resources, not giving other places on the planet the opportunities that we've had because we got a jumpstart on consumption. But we can learn to consume less. So, I mean, that's, that's another, the acoustics. The, um, we oh, just, hold I, on. Before you, let me stop you kindly. Be acoustics. I'm sure that people listening, certainly myself, are very sensitive to this issue you're raising about acoustics. And that is 
We don't want to disturb the people next door by playing music. We don't want to be disturbed by their playing music. We don't want to disturb people next door if we raise our voices and sing, and, and we don't want to be disturbed by it. What are some of the methods that you use to uh, prevent sound transmission? Well, that's a whole science, and I don't mind going into it. But um, we'll go you know, into it a little uh, bit for us. Okay, Give it a little so bit. two distinct walls between each uh, condominium, two two by four walls with a one and a half inch gap between the two. Then uh, plywood shear on the outside of one of them, and then uh, two layers of five eighths extra dense sheetrock on the, each side of each of those walls jam-packed with, uh, you know, blown-in cellulose insulation. Um, uh, no plumbing is touching the framing because that makes a noise. So when somebody turns on the water or the shower, you don't hear their shower next door because no, because you have that one-and-a-half-inch gap, you can make sure that nobody hears each other. Um, uh, no drilling holes for the wiring because it goes in between those holes too. No... Uh, uh, electric panel, no, no electric outlets anywhere uh, within two feet of each other back to back. I mean, it's quite an exhaustive list, including a, and a great deal of caulking along the bottom, the top, around, uh, you know, what, what are called Lowry pads behind the outlets. I mean, I've made my career out of making sure that my neighbors can't hear each other to the point that we have at least an, what's called an STC of uh, sound transfer coefficient of 63 to 65, oftentimes higher. The, the plywood is in there was with the res, uh, with the chipboard because so that way you don't have a resonant frequency. They frequent the two uh, diaphragms vibrate at different frequency, counseling each other out. For example, um, and um, we have an STC of at least sixty three to sixty five, sometimes higher, which means that you would have to yell at the absolute top of your lungs for somebody to hear you next door. I mean, well, you talk. You're talking on a topic that happens to be near and dear to my heart. And uh, in 1979, I built a solar uh, building at Wilbur Hot Springs, and I did everything possible that I could think of at the time uh, to, to pre uh, prevent sound transmission. And uh, I was successful for the most part, but then there were some areas where the sound went right through. Uh, I used cement walls packed full. Uh, try to uh, left some space, but uh, there were areas uh, up in the uh, uh, up in the sleeping lofts where the sound went right through, as if it was water going through a hole. And I've been <laughs> I've been working on that for now what <laughs> forty years. That's how uh, sound trans. That's how sound engineers uh, talk about it: water going through. You know, a quarter size hole in your boat will sink your boat if it's just the yes. size of a quarter. So right. um, nail holes add up and all the rest adds up. You have to watch them, but you know, you get pretty good at it. And I've had no complaints for a very long time. But anyway, other ways, you know, this group who we had 13 school teachers here in this town, a lot of people that were making, you know, 20 to $30,000 a year. Um, uh, we wanted to have all sustainably grown lumber. So we did that. You don't see, no regular developer is going to do that. We had uh, solar panels. None of these, 34 households had solar panels before. My average energy bill runs about, uh, my average electric bill runs about uh, minus $80 a, a year. And with one kilowatt of solar power, because there's so much about the house that's in, if, if very efficient and including the natural light. I mean, you know, the only one complaint I have about my house is I feel like I'm leaving the lights on all the time, even when they're off. And I'm constantly going back in the room thinking, oh, I must have left the lights on and they're not on. And I've been living in it for 15 years. So, Does each home have its own inverter system and a battery bank or, had, or is it a central uh, inverter system that sends the electricity to all the homes? Every house has its own inverter, and, uh, but the, the electricity still goes to the grid. There's no batteries. Oh, God. So I'm basically subsidizing my neighbors outside of the co-housing. I understand because you're, you're, you're producing more than you're using. Exactly. Exactly. And, uh, our energy efficient is pretty amazing too. My highest in my highest heating bill. And I live up by, you know, not far from Lake Tahoe and, uh, my highest heat has been about $20 a month. So 
What is the R value of your walls and uh, uh, roofs? Oh, uh, the uh, roof is about R42, and but that doesn't include all the radiant barriers and stuff that we also incorporated. And remember, this is ch cheaper than average construction. When we started this, everybody thought it would be a $150 a square foot. We ended up building it at, at $95 a square foot. Oh, my gosh. Phenomenal. That is a phenomenal. What year did you build it, Chuck? This was uh, 2005 and 2006, and but it was the height of the... The height of the boom, you know, which made it complicated. And then Katrina happened too. Plywood went from twenty dollars a sheet to thirty dollars a sheet. So, but you know, luckily I I uh, I learned how to build very early. My dad was a contractor, and and this has to be production construction. This is forty three thousand square feet total for thirty four houses. So it's got to be a little factory. It has to be an absolute factory. Nobody's sitting around with their hands on their hips you know, talking about anything. They have to know exactly what they're doing when they show up. And in, in the modules, are there two homes connected and then two more and two more? Are they all connected? How does, how there does are that four work? plexes and six plexes. Four and six places. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, in your, how many square feet is each one? They range from 900 square feet to 1,600 square feet each condo. Okay. Unless you want to say something more about this, I'd like to now switch over and talk about your solution to homelessness. Yes, I would too. Because Thank you. Can we do that? Absolutely. I appreciate that. Good. So because, and then, uh, well, let's start out by your rattling off, if you will, some of your important statistics, which you have in the beginning of the book. Well, thank you. Um, gee. You know, uh, it's such well, a... Well, I'll read them for, I'll read them for you. Okay. Because <laughs> one of the great things, one of the great things that Chuck says here in the book, he says, this book is for about 2,900 city councilors of the 482 incorporated municipalities. It's to the 2,900 city town planning commissioners. It's to the 482 city town managers and the 482 city town community development directors. And he goes on and on to the 290 board of supervisors, 290 planning commissioners, 58 mental health departments, 58 sheriff's offices, and on and on is who he wrote this book to because what he's saying is, and I quote, Thousands and thousands of people want to solve this problem. They know the why, and now they can learn how. So, Chuck, give us some of the how. Yeah, the big thing I want to uh, communicate uh, is that how. I mean, this was a city, American Canyon, which is in Napa County, a brand new town of about uh, 10,000 when it was incorporated. And they decided that the first thing that they wanted to do after they made their city hall was to address the people that were sleeping under bridges in their town. I mean, they just didn't feel good about their town when you leave that many people to their own devices. And when I say that many people, we only built 70 units, but we had 480 applications on the very first day the applications were taken. So, um, so it is a drop in the bucket, no doubt. But the, the big how is I'm so impressed that this city uh, decided with a, a, a $461,000 to buy a site in the town, a, a three and a half acre site, and then put out a competition on how to accomplish a, um, a very, very, very low um, house, uh, cost housing project that would service people that were sleeping under the bridges. And I have to say that the very the grand opening, a guy named Matt got up to the podium and he says he, his there were about 150 people in the audience and he says um, he says to the audience in a quiet way he says, you know that uh, off ramp you took to get into town here, you know off of highway uh, off the highway to get into town, I've been sleeping under that off that under that half ramp for the last six years, and I'm a Vietnam veteran. So, um, and there were lots of vets in that housing project that, um, 
And, um, and so to, to see them when they moved in and to see them now, it's, it's quite different. They were all very shell-shocked. I mean, I'm not sure what was different, which, which was more difficult for them, serving in Vietnam or being homeless for a half a dozen years, but they were both a pain and, and one led to the other. So basically American Canyon decided, you know what, we're gonna, we're gonna serve these people who served us. You know what, we're not gonna abandon them. We're not gonna leave them under the bridges. We're gonna do what we can right off the bat. And in doing so, in their case, they really made a model project. Nobody, nobody disputes that. It's, it's really what a town can do. And you know, of course, a nonprofit was hired soon after I was hired as the architect. And um, and um, and basically every single town in the U.S. could actually do this same thing. You know, um, uh, um, you know, I was uh, I was at a six-hour homeless conference in San Francisco a couple years ago. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, um, uh, we all got together, 300 people, and said, okay, if we were going to do one thing immediately, what would we do? And we would get the city or the county to give us permission to put a tiny house camp on a site. And there are also great examples of that. My favorite one is Opportunity Village in um, Eugene, Oregon, where they built tiny houses for $8,000 a piece. Um, they had a lot of volunteer, lo uh, a lot of volunteer uh, labor. You know, this whole pandemic would have been a great time to have done it because there's lots of people that are not employed right now who could be helping to be helping homeless people build their own tiny house. And that's what they did in, um, in uh, Eugene where, um, you know, everybody, what, no matter what your abilities were, whether you only could sit there and talk on the phone, you know, you were given, you were given duties to do there, find out where the cheapest plywood is and can, and go, let's go on from there. Um, and, um, they built these little tiny houses for 8,000, 30 units total there. And, uh, they self-manage it entirely. Seven people who live there, um, uh, are aboard. And they rotate that board, and they have seven uh, clerical folks from town, um, clergy people from town, who um, also help monitor their management. I mean, basically, the software is always just as important as the hardware, and making everybody feel safe and accommodated. So the thinking there is, if one person can use the bus, and one person can shop, and one person can cook, and one person can clean up. You know, we've, we're onto something. We can actually accomplish a great deal of, of enhancing our better lives now as a result. Uh, the city of Eugene um, uh, leased them the property for a dollar a year. Um, their, their first year, the vote was eight to one at the city council. And uh, all subsequent seven years since then, it's been nine to one. I mean, nine to zero, nine to zero at the city council. In other words, they have seen the benefit. Uh, at my last report, they've had zero ever um, police calls, which is just astounding because uh, the police are often called to help the homeless, uh, quote unquote, help the homeless. In our town, they actually, the police took a sleeping bag from the, a homeless man, a Native American, who um, died that night at 49 years old of hypothermia. So, you know, we structurally are pretty upside down. The big other takeaway in this uh, in this topic, in my view, is that the average homeless person in the USA dies at 49 years old. So um, it's a it's a 30 year life uh, uh, sentence, death sentence, um, and it's cruel and unusual punishment along the way. I mean, look at the the Texas freeze. You know, there's just I mean, it was bad enough for people who had houses, etc. I mean, we heard all about that. We, I haven't heard a story yet about the homeless people of Austin, of Houston, of all these other towns where um, they probably died. And those numbers will definitely come in in the co coming weeks and months. Charles, uh, Chuck, in, in, in your book, uh, you talk about two approaches to homelessness. One is the approach that you're advocating, which, you, which you're going to tell us about how it's cost effective for the society. There's another pro approach, which you quote in your book, which is the Darwinian approach. Please uh, tell our listeners about those two approaches. 
Uh, you know, it, it just is so counterintuitive to me that we would let anybody freeze outside because there's been a dozen studies on the topic now around the USA. Uh, Miami did the best study where they showed that a homeless person out uh, outside at night ends up costing the city, the state, the federal, all told about the county, especially um, about uh, 40,000 in Miami, $40,000 a year per homeless project. They have a guy in Reno, Nevada, who's now known as Million Dollar Monty. And with all of his stays at the police department and all of his stays at the emergency room and all the different calls that are uh, summoned to help him do this or that, uh, everything but get a house, um, he, uh, he is costing the city of Reno about a million dollars a year. I mean, that's so upside down. So the studies have ranged from 20000 to 40000 average being 30000 in terms of what it costs. And that, and that is easy to accomplish. We could do that. So we not only, um, we're afraid it's going to cost us money, but we know that it's not. But what bothers me the most, I guess, is that, um, you know, I lived in Denmark for two years and I was astounded, you know, walking through the streets of Copenhagen and all the rest, that I almost never saw a homeless person. There's supposedly about 10,000 in that country, but um, I never saw them. And I would ask people, why, you know, why, why don't I ever see any homeless people here? And, and they would say that, well, you know, we take the attitude, I take the attitude that it, that could be my brother, you know, that there. So I'm going to do everything I can, whether it's pay taxes or lobby that make sure that we have some accommodation somewhere. And uh, I've been told now in the U.S. five times that, you know, Chuck, it's Darwinian. It's Darwinian. This is the way it's supposed to be. Maybe these people are supposed to die out on the street. Maybe that's the way God intended it. And those two things are absolutely polar opposites of each other. Um, I, I, uh, I, know of, I know a lot of motivated housing activists in the U.S., no doubt, and they might sense that it might be my brother. But it's so interesting to me that that is a common sentiment there. That could be my brother. And uh, we don't seem to have that same, that same attitude, even, you know, I hate to say it, even among the Christians who will advocate that, that we should be uh, a, a addressing our brother as if they're our brother, but we don't. And I think that's where the major attitude has to shift, you know, that it's not, a, a not okay to leave so much humanity peril in the night cold. Uh, that's where the, you know, if we choose that, um, then we can solve the other problems. You know, if we just say that, okay, this is not the right thing to do, and we can readily, in my opinion, get to the solution, because the solution's right there, and it will save us money. Everybody's clear on that. You make these little tiny houses, I mean, in Eugene alone, you know, let's say you have 30 tiny houses, that's about 45 people that's living there, including couples, so that could be 45 times 30,000 a year that it's saving the state, the city, the county, and everybody else. So it's the practical thing to do. So it's more of a of a, a motivation of a, of a sentiment uh, than it is a practical matter of making this thing happen. It could create jobs, you know, and all the rest. It's, it's got a lot of benefits in society, but um, it's not being embraced, in my view, as it should. One of the things that you point out, sadly, in your book, is the significant percentage of the homeless that are veterans. And this, uh, this is an issue that has been going on since our Revolutionary War, uh, which is how do we treat veterans after the war is over? And we know that in many cases they've been neglected. And what you have brought to light in your book, I believe you said that at least 25%, if not higher, of the homeless of veterans. And the, towny, the tiny houses addresses this to a certain extent. Are, are people, are veterans who are homeless coming forth to, to participate in these projects as best you know? Yeah, yeah, the Veterans Administration is, in fact, in, uh, in, um, um, uh, in American Canyon, in Napa County, 
they ended up putting an office right in our common building that we um, have for the, uh, the project there, you know, that has, you know, laundry and dining and lots of other things there. Everybody, again, has their own kitchen in their house, but uh, there's a possibility for common dining, et cetera. And, and there's, you know, computers and job training, um, counselors, uh, people there to help you get social security, get your social security. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people in this country who could collect social security if they had an address and a phone number. And, um, you know, they worked, they worked in our society once upon a time, they earned social security. In fact, it was savings count for their dire, potentially dire retirement. And uh, they should be getting it. Um, but in any case, when you're homeless, it's virtually impossible sometimes to get it. So, um, so uh, you know, this gives counselors, gives them an address, gives them a phone number. Um, it makes it so much easier for all of the jurisdictions to figure it out, including the fire departments. You know, where I live locally, it's amazing how the arguments go. You know, if uh, there's, it's a lot of a forest around us, and if some homeless person is having, you know, heart defibrillations out in the woods and a fire truck has to go out in the middle of the night and find out, find this person and try to get them service. It could take a, a fire truck out of service for a whole evening. And so all of a sudden the fire department's coming to the city council saying, we need another fire truck, basically. You know, we don't need, we, we thought we only needed four, but we need five because we almost need one just to serve this, the homeless people out, out of town. At least we need it in case we have to serve one of them. So, so uh, yeah, and, uh, and, the homeless, and the homeless vets is a travesty, no doubt about it. And, so you know, the, you know uh, I think in our county, about 50% are, uh, have some mental problem. They usually have, they have uh, you know, alcohol, drugs, or a mental neurological issue, or all three. And um, that tends to require a lot of attention of one kind or another. But it's always much, much easier and better if they get that attention in one place in this common building that we build on site, basically. In other words, the county can come there and service, you know, 10 people in, in one day instead of two or three based on them, you know, some, some homeless person making some appointment, which they already are challenged to accomplish. Now, when you describe the co-housing, which are people, you, you put out the word to the community, uh, people come together, they apply, they participate. Uh, with the solution to homelessness, we're talking about individual tiny homes that are separated from one another. Tell us about those individual homes, what they contain, something about the building process, and then what are shared by the people who live in these tiny homes. They're all 500, roughly 500 square feet, correct? Yes. For their, they range from 450 to 600, but they average, they actually average 486 square feet in American Canyon. Um, and they're actually duplexes and triplexes. They're tiny, but uh, they were built by a contractor and, um, and uh, in, in that case, in American Canyon. So they have a kitchen, dining, living, bedroom, bathroom. You know, five They're self-contained. They've got self -contained. the house that has everything. Hundred percent self-contained. I mean, there's so much that we have to do, in my view, to bring the honor back to these people because that's the only way they're ever going to be able to function in society again is if their self-worth can increase too. You know, uh, one of my very favorite books of all time, was written by uh, John Steinbeck, it was the only only one of his two nonfiction books. And it was about the um, homeless camps that were built during the Depression in, uh, uh, in the 30s in California. 21 camps built from Redding to San Diego, very much along the lines of, of Valley View. And, you know, when, when he was, uh, a lot of it was super gratifying. The book is called The, um, the Harvest Gypsies. But um, uh, a lot of it's very gratifying. But he, he, he said the, the thing that struck him the most was when he was interviewing a, a guy who was and his family who was leaving the homeless shelter, and the guy had a smile on his face when he moved in. He of course was not smiling, and he was get you know getting in his big old jalopy and, and driving out, and he had a big smile on his face, and and um, and so Steinbeck asked him, "Why are you smiling? You know, why, what are you so elated about?" 
And he says, wow, now that I feel like I've got my feet back under me, I feel like I can go into society and contribute. And since they believed in me enough, they gave me such a hand up that they allowed me to move in this camp for a year so I can get my family fed and get my family back together almost a year. Um, I'm able to, I'm not only able to go out into society, but I'm motivated to go out in society and contribute back and do my part and all the rest. So, and, you know, I'm not saying that was universal, but it was, you know, uh, it, it was quite contrasting to the amount of contempt that really real homeless people have. I mean, as I mentioned in the book, uh, 50% 50 of the fires started in Nevada County and one on Main Street just a few weeks ago, quite consequential fires. Um, you know, in some cases, thousands and thousands of acres, half of them have been started by homeless people. You know, they've got to cook their beans somewhere. And, um, and, um, and, you know, Oh, so when you, excuse me. So yeah. you're, you're not saying, yeah, just to clarify for our listeners, yeah. you're not in any way implying that homeless people start fires. You're saying that since homeless people are living out in the open, they make fires to cook and for their food and inadvertently start a forest fire. No, that's exactly what I mean. Yeah. And we had some guy here in town who was, I saw him on my way to work, you know, yelling and screaming about it. In fact, I have no place to cook my breakfast. I have no place. He was just yelling at the top of his lungs on Main Street. And there was an abandoned house on Main Street. He went into the house and um, a half an hour later, the whole house is on fire. So it's, you know, it's just chaotic to have this situation. And it's not a chaos that serves us. I mean, Darwinian or not, it does not serve us in any way, shape or form to have random people walking the streets trying to survive and growing an immense amount of contempt for our society. I mean, I often think that contempt is the number one cause of crime. You know, when people just do not appreciate what the rest of the world is trying to do to build a, a, a viable society um, because they feel like they've been excluded and left out in so many ways and marginalized in so many ways. And they have been, I mean, you know, the interesting thing about one of the sociological studies about homeless people are people who have been marginalized from very early in their life. And um, then they, they finally get a, you know, in their twenties, they get a, a, a minimum wage job. Um, and, uh, for one reason, uh, uh, for one reason or another, their rent goes up, and then all of a sudden they're sleeping outside at night, and then they're sleeping outside for four or five nights, and then they come to work quite disheveled and not smelling very good. So then they get fired, and people themselves don't even know the cascading effects of, of sleeping outside. Don't get me wrong; I realize that some people actually want to sleep outside, and that's another question. But the housing that we're talking about are housing for people who don't want to sleep outside. I think a lot of us don't recognize just how close many people are to being homeless. We had a town hall meeting here in Fort Bragg, California, some years ago, and unsheltered people came and they taught us a lot about unsheltered living. They taught us about the difference between local unsheltered and migrant unsheltered and how they treat the town differently. And at one poignant moment, Chuck, a woman stood up and she said, until recently, I was a regular middle class person. I had a place to live managing a, uh, a, a trailer park and I uh, had a good job, a decent pay and a place to live. And it was so lovely right on the ocean that I invited my daughter to come and live with me. And the two of us worked together and managed the park and had a lovely life. And the trailer park got sold and the new owners came in and put in new management. And the next thing I knew, myself and my daughter were out on the street. And then she pointed at two people in the first row and she said, if it weren't for those two people who took us in, we would be living under a tree somewhere because that's what was left to us. And it was a, a very poignant moment and letting us know, you know, she just looked like another regular a middle class person, but uh, but she would have been out, and I think she was speaking, and she said she was speaking. Uh, for they uh, the say the the word that I get, you know, when you do re internet research, is that there's a significant percentage of the American population 
who are within months of being out on the street if they lose their job, and a very significant number of, of people who, if some uh, utility in their home, such as a stove, uh, 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 breaks down or the furnace, they can't afford to have it fixed. I, th I think you're very you're very yeah, aware of it. Be so be. getting back to the to the little houses now, to the they're 500 square feet, they're self-contained, and then there are uh, community services. And I want you to talk some now, please, about the agreements, the agreements that the people who are homeless make in order to live in the tiny homes. Because one of the concerns that one hears from people is, well, you put a bunch of homeless people together in housing and it's going to be chaos. And, you know, half of them will be drunk. They'll be running around screaming. They'll be stealing. They'll be, you know, just as ripping things off the wall and selling them in town, etc. You know, the critics. So tell us what, you know, how that works so that you, you create order. And as you say, you know, very little crime or fires, please. Yeah, I mean, uh, like I, I said, the software is just as important as the hardware for sure. And it takes talented people to put that together. Although I've seen people who um, uh, you would not expect be able to, um, you know, to uh, get that management uh, lined up, able to do it. In fact, that's one of the things that surprises me a lot. Um, I talked about the tiny houses in Valley View. I just want to mention the tiny houses in Eugene one last time because they're eight Please. by eight by eight and very economical to build. And the um, I, again, the future residents, the homeless people built them with a bunch of contractors locally um, over a few weekends. And um, and they're not self-contained. They didn't even have electricity. Um, they were just, uh, you know, framed walls. And um and uh, all of their uh, dinners and, uh, and bathrooms they have in common. So they have a big yurt uh, for their common space that they have their computers on and dining and all the rest. They also have an outdoor dining room when the weather allows. They have a nice kitchen. They have a nice workshop. All of that was built with volunteer labor. That's why it was kept down to a cost of $8,000 a house. And the residents actually took their sewer line. At first, there was all... Uh, imported water and, and uh, exported uh, porta potties but um, the um, the uh, residents themselves built a, um, a line a sewer line to the street and hooked up to the street um, with the city approval and they brought in water so now they have showers and laundry on site too as opposed to going to the laundry mat they've been able to make a very high functioning village in the last eight years um, you're saying and, that each person each person has a private bedroom, yeah. and then everything else is shared? Yes, exactly. This sounds, sounds very uh, familiar to the Palo Solari concept of many years ago. Yeah, it's, I, I, remember, I, I remember visiting him in Arcosante, and he had that, where each, each couple or person had a private bedroom, and then everything else was communal and shared. Yeah, and it's actually not that foreign. At the turn of the century, 1900, you know, SROs, single room occupancy, was actually extremely common, especially towns like San Francisco, where, you know, young women in particular would come to move to town and they would have a place to stay where there was, you know, a co-management going on and they felt safe, for example. And lots of towns had those. So single room occupancies aren't that new. The only thing that's new about it is we're making them out of little cottages for lots of reasons. I mean, we're a little bit enamored with uh with tiny houses right now as a culture, but it turns out to be the path of least resistance. Even in San Francisco, after that six hour seminar, um, the expert says the fastest thing you can do in this town is to build a bunch of eight by eight by eight plywood boxes, you know, that could be moved at a moment's notice, put them on little uh, pediments or on wheels or something, and then, uh, you know, be able to forklift them up and put them on a flat bed and move them if necessary, but get the bloody things built so you can get the night sky off the body and don't feel like you have to drink, you know, whiskey to get to sleep. That's what happens around here. You know, my talking to the various homeless people, they say, I have to drink, you know, a couple shots of whiskey just to get to sleep at night. So homelessness leads to, you know, lots of human and societal pathologies that we need to get them out of that setting. Well, you're right. Getting them into that setting includes not only making the little boxes, but you know, I'm so enamored with how they um, manage it at um, 
at what's called Opportunity Village in Eugene because they put seven people who live there on the board and then they're monitored by seven clergy from the town. The seven clergy usually come to their, their management meetings. And I think it was the first two years they kicked out three guys who were abusing their girlfriends. They didn't want that to continue at all. And, um, and these guys were probably abusing their girlfriends when they were living in the woods, but they, you know, the girlfriends were not going to leave under those circumstances because they needed them for protection. So basically getting, setting up a, creating a setting where women can get safe is big deal. It's a really big deal because they're not safe out in the sticks. I mean, there's just way too many stories. In fact, I would like to see if women around the U.S. knew how dangerous this is for other women to be sleeping outside at night. I would love to see women, different women's organizations um, in their town lobbying their town. Because when, when you go into a town, what you would find if you go meet with the planning department, you will find that city after city, Sacramento, for example, I, I just learned the other day, owns about 300 parcels in Sacramento. So just choose one. Uh, you know, one that's a little bit out of the way, but has a bus station nearby um, where you could build 20, 30 tiny houses on it. And by the way, some people feel like it's OK to build a tiny, you know, like two tiny houses in the back of a church and two tiny houses in the back of a ranch or whatever. That absolutely does not work because that can't be managed together. And it's not how it's not how you support individuals. I mean. I, I believe in housing first, but really I believe in housing second. I believe in community first. If you can make a community work, you can do wonders. And as I was saying a minute ago, I'm just dead amazed by how clever these many of these homeless people are. In Opportunity Village, they had no heat. They lived the, through the first winter with no heat. But a, fi a few of them figured out how to get donated some solar panels. A few of them figured out how to get batteries. A few of them figured out how to get it wired. You know, you can figure that all out on YouTube now. And um, and they all the all the 30 units now have solar heat in the houses. So, but that took the first year, and that took cooperation. That's not something that's going to happen by individuals who just get a tiny house. So, I I really want to dwell on this community first because what you see when you get 45 people together and it's highly facilitated you see an immense amount of intelligence that can come to fruition that can't otherwise come to fruition. When people are cast adrift and um, lost, you know, it, it goes downhill from there. It doesn't, it, there's no way that collectively it's going to grow a capacity. Like when you have, um, you know, 45 people pulling together, you, you can, you can really do a lot on that tug rope. So, um, so, okay. So what kind of agreements do they have? Well, at Opportunity Village, for example, you know, there's no alcohol on site. Um, there's no bothering your neighbors. At, you know, there's no touching your neighbors. There's no um, uh, making noise at night. Um, there's no guests, which is kind of interesting. You know, although I do feel, having designed a few uh, homeless projects myself, I do feel there's room for a ton of variety there. In fact, you can just go with what works and not with what work, work, what does not work. What, you know, there's, there's some projects where they don't allow pets and there's some projects that do allow pets. There's some projects that are completely dry and there's some that are what's called wet. In other words, they allow alcohol as long as you don't, no public display of being drunk and no public display of drinking uh, uh, even. And, um, and I really believe that that management has a variety that, is just as varied as we are as a culture. And basically, you know, from what I can tell, every pocket of America is a different culture, practically after designing 55 co-housing communities around the U.S. Um, I feel like I, I, I want to practice and I try really hard to practice architecture as an, as an anthropologist first and try to figure out who these people are, what are their values, what are their experiences, and where can we grow from that? Um, and I'm always astounded. They function at a much, much higher level than they ever functioned on their own previously. Do you happen to have a copy handy there of your book, A Solution to Homelessness? Yes, I do. If you'd be so kind as to turn to page 85. Yes. So on page 85, dear listeners, he, he lists the, the basic five rules 
no violence to yourselves or others, no theft, no alcohol, illegal drugs, or drug paraphernalia, no persistent disruptive behavior, and five, everyone must contribute to the operation and maintenance of the village. And after that, he, he has the uh, agreements, different from the rules. These are the uh, agreements. And, you know, I don't know how much time we ought to take on this, but I'm very tempted to ask you to just read at least some of the agreements, if not all of them, Chuck, because they, they are meaningful, they're beautiful, and I, and I think they, they really apply much further than to the homeless. Yeah, true. In fact, I'm writing a book right now called Community Enhanced um, uh, uh, Community, uh, Neighborhoods. And um, it, uh, it really does start with people having the intent that I want to be a good neighbor. So basically this lineup is, um, I, you know, I not only see the benefits to me, I see the benefits to everybody else, which in, in, in turn is me. You know, my favorite poem in the English language is, is the shortest poem in the English language. And it's simply me, we. Um, and um, that was written by Muhammad Ali in 1974. <laughs> and um, it basically says, if I'm going to, I will never reach my potential if we don't reach our potential. I will never be able to um, live out my grandest um, hopes for us if, I, if we don't live out, or I won't be able to live out our grandest hopes for me if we don't live out our grandest hopes for we. So it starts out in broad terms. I will be a positive member of this community and contribute towards making it safe, secure, clean, and pleasant place to live. Therefore, I agree to the following, which by the way, these functional communities start out with giving each other permission. In other words, you know, Richard, if I say something that annoys you, I give you permission to tell me directly, not to tell the management, not to tell the cops, not to gossip about me with the other neighbors, but just to come right up to me and Richard say, and say, Chuck, I can... I appreciate what you bring to this community, but you did this, this, and this, which annoyed me. And then I turn around and I give you permission. Richard, I really appreciate what you bring to our community. And if I ever do anything to annoy you, I really would appreciate if you came up and said something to me. Because that's how you, giving each other permission to be good communitarians is really foundational when it comes to um, growing a neighborhood. Um, uh, what I will do is based on love and respect for myself and others. So it starts out in broad terms. I mean, who knows what that means? And, you know, at some level, it's just basically um, noting that we have goals, too. We're going to get down to the activities and we're going to get down to the specific behavior. But if we can all agree that, um, you know, there's a benefit to, uh, you know, loving ourselves and others, then, you know, it's foundational as well. Um, I will not disrespect others based on ethnicity, religion, gender, sexual orientation, handicap, lifestyle choices, or economic status. We all have the right to expect dignity and opportunity. You know, a lot of this sounds like rhetoric, but I don't consider it rhetoric because, you know, we've grown up in a culture where it's easily marginalized others. These individuals have been marginalized usually rather severely. So they're simply in that you know, they always say that abuse, abusers were abused. And so if these people were abused, which statistically most of them were, um, then don't, don't further that abuse by making light of your neighbor. You know, uh, you know, don't gossip about him if you can avoid it. You know, if you have an issue with him, go talk to him directly. Chuck. Um, I, I will help. I... Yeah. Sorry. What you have said here. It's not rhetoric. It's powerful. And I wouldn't be asking you to take the time to read it if I thought it was just rhetoric. I appreciate and respect your taking the time to read it to us and making comments on what you've read. Thank you. I, you know, I, I don't disrespect rhetoric. I just think it's part of the picture. And I actually do believe strongly that you have to start off with rhetoric. You have to say, what is our big macro intent? You know, um, you know, live in community, whatever it is, let's get that on the table. Basically, why bother making this little, why make it, why bother making this little uh, enclave, you know? So um, I will help make uh, Opportunity Village a place where everyone feels safe and respected for my own safety 
and as well as the safety of others. I will not carry a weapon or act violently towards other or myself. Sometimes it's even repetitive, just, you know, in other words. Uh, since stealing is one of the most upsetting things that can happen in our community, I will not steal and I will make uh, uh, and I will not steal and will make the members of the village council aware of any stealing I see. So they say it takes three things to to make a community, and that's a sense of belonging, uh, a sense of accountability, and a sense of identity. And accountability is real. You know, if you I grew up in a small town. And if I honked my horn after dark, somebody would put their precipitous hand on my hood and say, kid, we don't do that here. That's back to giving each other uh, permission to, um, you know, we're not going to call the police. We're going to talk to each other until we, until we can work it out. Belonging. Um, let's say it again. Be say it again. Belonging, accountability. And identity. And identity. To the point where you're proud that you live in this place. You, if, if you seek out to make yourself proud to live in this place, you will not take uh, aberrant behavior for granted. You will not accept aberrant behavior. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, um, and basically, you're just saying to everybody, look, we're all here to help you, but you have to be somewhat accountable too. Yeah. Um, um, I will respect other people's property and community property, and I expect others to, to respect mine. I know that illegal drugs and alcohol can cause damage to my community. I agree not to use illegal drugs and alcohol while residing in this village. I will honor quiet hours from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. so that others um, and myself can stay healthy and rested. I understand that no personal guests will be allowed during that time. I want to live in a clean, litter-free, comfortable space. And which, by the way, um, you know, Opportunity Village has had an incredible track record of segueing people to apartments and to, and, to, and to real houses. In other words, sure, if you get a partner and you've been living here for a year or two and you've gotten your act together, you know, segue out to, uh, you know, life, uh, you know, the life. I forget the numbers, but it's, it's well into the 20s now of people that have segued out of Opportunity Village and into back into mainstream society. Why would they want to leave? Well, good question. I mean, you know, if you can't have a partner overnight, you're probably going to want to leave eventually. Oh, I mean, there's, oh there's I, basic human things. That, that's, that's a good reason. If you can't have a partner overnight, right. I want to live in a clean, litter-free, comfortable space where I can uh, bring friends, family, and other guests. Also, I know that many communities such as ours get closed down for health and safety reasons. I will keep the area in and around where I live clean and orderly and not store my personal items outside of my building's footprint or allowed storage space. I will help keep the community areas clean and I will pick up after myself and my pet if I have one <clears throat> and keep my pet leased at all times. I understand that only limited number of pets will be allowed in the village in order to maintain an orderly environment. I should also mention here that um, the, the person who started Champion was the project manager for Opportunity Village is a guy named Andrew Heben. And he did something wondrous, very much like what Katie and I did in co-housing in Europe, is you know we went and, and visited a couple hundred co-housing. We stayed at them for 13 months and to the point that we understood it so that we could actually design them. Andrew Heben, he traveled across the U.S. and he stayed in what's called tent cities here, there, and everywhere, Portland and Chicago and, you know, wherever anybody would put up a dozen or more tents, he would actually stay in those tent cities. So you can hear the management talk coming through, you know, those experiences. The name of his book is uh, Tent City Urbanism. And it's about his trek across the U.S. staying in 10 cities. I know that I, it can take a lot of work to keep the village safe, clean, and pleasant place to live. I agree to work at least 10 hours a week on operation and maintenance of the village. This is pretty key. That's the currency of consequence, really. This includes serving <clears throat> on uh, security teams, helping with kitchen duties, construction projects, maintenance and cleanup crews, helping pl 
plan activities and other jobs that need to be shared by community members. I also know that there are financial costs to keeping the village running. I will support the goal of self-sufficiency by contributing each month, either financially or through sweat equity, by participating in micro business opportunities or fundraising events. So you can see here where the real drilling down is happening, you know, beyond the more rhetorical um, goals of earlier. And, I, and I, like I say, I, I know for that both of those are absolutely essential, you know, the specifics and the general. And how do they maintain accountability with on that dimension? They actually keep uh, they actually keep hours. You know, you you go tell they trade off doing the management, and you tell somebody who's the head of uh, maintenance that I put in three hours today. Um, you know, taking the old paint off of uh, the gate or whatever. And everybody in the community gets to take a turn at managing the community. Yes, I mean they. They basically, you know, what ends up happening is you end up making some committees and there's usually two or three people on the maintenance committee. And um, one of those or you so you can usually tell either of those three people how many hours you did today or this week on different things. There's a bit of an honor system, but the, there's an also an ob obvious more more obvious accountability as well. This sort of connects with my concept for Congress, because I would like to see Congress populated uh, by the lottery system rather than by elections, because I think the average person who would be drawn to it could do as good enough job, particularly when they're not being influenced by, by uh, money and financial interests. Yeah, I agree. I also know that, okay, so um, oh, I will support a, the goal of self-sufficiency by contributing each month, either financially or through sweat equity, by participating in micro business opportunities or fundraising events. You know, as far as I know, the city of Eugene doesn't subsidize this project at all. At That's all. Cool. Although what they did originally is they allowed them to build the houses without uh, fees, without mm -hmm. city fees. And they gave them, you know, carte blanche, you know, no building code requirements because as FEMA says, this is an emergency. You know, if you look at FEMA's de definitions of what an emergency is, Homelessness is squarely in the center of that definition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I will attend the weekly village meetings unless I have ex acceptable reason for absence. So this is where people can talk about, you know, the evolving management at some level, in which case I will find out what went on by reading the minutes. I understand that decisions will be made through a majority vote and that the board of directors of the nonprofit reserves the right to override decisions made. I agreed to abide by all decisions. So the, the board of directors of the nonprofit are those seven clergy that I was talking about. And by the way, I want to thank you, Richard, for making me read this. It's been a long time since I've read it. And um, you're right. It's, it's very well done. I it's, extremely, <laughs> it's extremely well done, and it could serve as a model for communities, whether they're small housing or not. These neighborhoods could could sign on for this, Chuck. This, yeah. this is a beautifully written a group of agreements. People well, who live in a, people who live in a high rise apartment building could sign on for this and help each other. That's exactly right. Where I live, we have also three pages of agreements. Um, they re read similar to this. Um, I don't know who crafted this. I'll bet it was probably people who lived there as well as Andrew Heben and as, as well as the nonprofit that runs the board. You know, it was, it was I know for a fact it uh, went through numerous iterations. Where I live, we, uh, we had a committee of a couple people put it together and then we consensed it all together with some amendments. Um, I, we only have to come to where I live. We only have to do one management meeting a month. I affirm that I have completed the background check form. Honestly, along with all of the applicable documents, I understand that if I, the background check reveals otherwise, I could otherwise be asked to leave immediately. Mm -hmm. I, prom I promise to keep all of these agreements as well as others that are approved by the village meetings. If I violate any agreements, the members of the village council are authorized to ask me to leave temporarily. So again, over and over, giving each other permission or in serious or repeated cases to leave permanently. I will do so peacefully and not return unless I'm authorized to do so. 
I know that Opportunity Village is a place where people value community and support each other. I will try to think of ways to make our community a better place to live. When I am concerned or upset with situations in the village, I will bring these problems to the attention of the appropriate people so that we can work together to figure things out. And of course, the most important line in the whole book is, here's where you sign, you know. Um, but I, that last two sentences, or I want to say, um, you know, there's three sentences, there's three places where I'm giving the community permission to um, let me know if I'm you know, not behaving because, you know, they all have the same intent of, you know, making a place where we can live peacefully. And a lot of these Speaking. people have aberrant behavior, you know, they're, you know, they have ADHD or, um, <clears throat> you know, attention deficit disorder. And so, you know, you're constantly being a part of the community. When I was a kid living in a small town, we had a kid in our town, uh, a young adult, um, on, uh, who was quite mentally disturbed. And ev the whole community realized that it was our responsibility to um, nurture him and cultivate his well-being to the best extent possible. These agreements that you were just hearing are from page 85 of Charles Durrett's book, a solution to homelessness in your town. It's, it's a must read, it's a delightful little book. It's full of pictures of the housing. It's actually has pictures of some of the homeless people themselves. And you get to look in detail at the look in their faces after they've lived in some of these homes. And you learn about the nature of the homes themselves. He has information in the book about landscaping, escaping, permeable pavers, glass exterior doors, sidings, paint, radiant barriers, uh, the roofs, the outdoor benches, planter benches, and more. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful guidebook, both philosophically and material. Uh, you you want to get this book. You want to share it with your neighbors and talk about it, really. It's an important book, partly because of the philosophy that it's bringing to us in terms of the housing, but also because of the philosophy it's bringing to us in terms of being community and living together peacefully and making the best of what we have. Charles Chuck Durrett, thank you so much for being with us today on Mind, Body, Health and Politics. It was, it was an educational pleasure to, to have you here. And uh, I look forward to another time in the future to have you back if you'll come with us. Of course, Richard, and I can't thank you enough, man. Thank you for getting this word out there. It's something we can address in our society. Thanks to people like you. And uh, Chuck, one last little personal touch. Uh, do you know Tom Dolan? I know him well, a uh, very well, good friend. He, uh, he proposed to his wife on my property in Sierra County. Well, last night I called my daughter, Serana, and I said, I've got an architect coming on tomorrow, and he lived at Doyle Street Housing. And my daughter lived at Doyle Street Housing, and that's how I got to know Tom Dolan. Oh, right on. Too cool. My daughter, Serana, yes. And uh, so hello from Serana in Haines, Alaska, and uh, a shout out to our friend Tom Dolan, who's also been to Wilbur Hot Springs many times. Oh, yeah. He's a, he's a devotee. Yes, he is. And by the way, uh, Chuck, in, in, in saying goodbye, if you happen to come over to the coast, we've got a great guest room. Please give me a jingle. I'd love to have you stay with us. Okay, I'm fully vaccinated, so I'd love to come We're over. Double vac we are double vaccinated, and we've got a great room for you. Do Take me Thank up on so it. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm going to take you up on that. I love Fort Bragg. I'm, I used to do salmon fishing out of Fort Bragg. I'm, I'm saying it sincerely. This isn't just a, you know, blow and smoke. I, I give us a jingle and stay with us. We've got a great little organic chicken farm and I'll show you my photovoltaic system. All right. Can't wait. Thank you so Take much. Care. Really appreciate bye -bye. it. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And thank you all for listening to today's broadcast of Mind, Body, Health and Politics. And thank you also to my staff, to our producer, Evacheska DeAngelis, to our producer, Charlie Deist, to our marketing director, Pamela Berry, to our publicist, Jessica Abercrombie, and our guest curator, Michelle McMillan, all of whom team up to make this broadcast possible, 
a community, a small community of people teaming up to make the broadcast possible. This preceding program was brought to you by Thanksgiving Coffee. The founder of Thanksgiving Coffee, Paul Katzif, is a social worker and political activist who improved the lives of millions of coffee growers around the world by getting them a substantial amount of the money that comes from producing coffee, whereas before Paul, they got very little. Paul has created three special mind, body, health, and politics coffee blends and donates 20% of all internet sales of these three special blends to the COVID Response Network, a nonprofit 501c3 whose mission is to protect California's North Coast from COVID, COVID Response Network. Go to the Thanksgiving Coffee Company website and buy Mind, Body, Health, and Politics coffee. You will support the COVID Response Network. You will help spare injury, save us from hospitalizations, and you will help save lives. Please join me next Tuesday at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time for our next stimulating broadcast when our guests will be Dr. Jerry and wife Julie Brown, and they are going to be participating in our ongoing series, Confessions of Psychedelic Elders. Tune in and hear about people, prominent people in their 70s and 80s, who will be openly talking about their experience with psychedelics over decades. Until next week, this is Dr. Richard Lewis Miller reminding you that good health is worth fighting for, and it's essential for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. 